So a neurotrophic factor uh, is a factor that helps the growth, the survival, or the maturation of neurons, the nerve cells uh, in the brain. And this is very relevant for Parkinson's because we, we are losing dopaminergic neurons in Parkinson's. So if we can give uh, a factor that helps those, those neurons survive or grow, then that will be great. Neurotrophic factors are, are not a new field. They were discovered by uh, this uh, lovely lady, Rita Levi-Montalcini. Uh, she was doing experiment in nerve cells from the chicken. Uh, so this is uh, nerve cells from a chicken embryo, and she treated them with uh, snake venom, actually. And she discovered that when you treat them with snake venom, then all these nerve cells start sending these projections. They grow. The, the neurons uh, become healthier. And then they started looking at, um, try to determine what in the snake venom was doing that, what substance in that poison was helping the neurons survive. And they discovered um, what's called NGF, or nerve growth factor. And Rita Levi-Moltoncini won, won the Nobel Prize uh, of Physiology and Medicine in 1986, together with Stanley Cohen, for the discovery of, of NGF, of nerve growth factor. So NGF was the first neurotrophic factor discovered but we now know there are many more. So we have uh, the NGF family, so these are molecules that are similar to NGF and they work in a similar way to NGF. We also have the GDNF family, which is a factor that I'm gonna tell you about later. There's other members in the GDNF family as well. We have other families of nerve growth factors like CDNF, MANF, CNTF. The nerves, nervous system in, in evolution has expanded a lot. So if we consider it a worm uh, has only like 302 neurons, the human brain has 10 billion neurons. Uh, so it's a huge number and it seems that to support that complexity, the, the, the bigger and more complex the neuron get, the brain gets, we need more and more of these uh, nerve, uh, neurotrophic factors. And when we lose those factors, then that can cause problems in the brain, which perhaps is what's happening in Parkinson's. So how do we know that GDNF is good for dopaminergic neurons? How do we know that GDNF helps in Parkinson's? So there's three evidence, and I'm going to show you three proofs. The first one comes from experiment in animals. This is a rat brain, a diagram of a rat brain. These are the dopaminergic neurons here. I mean, the, the rat, the brain of a rat is not quite the same as the brain of a human. The, the structure is a bit different, but uh, they still have dopaminergic neurons like we do. So this is where the dopaminergic neurons live, and then this is the area where they send their projections in the thread. There is a model for Parkinson's used in, in rodents, in rats, that consists of injecting a toxin into the brain of the rat. So if we inject a toxin there, then this toxin will affect those dopaminergic neurons, and those dopaminergic neurons will lose those projections. So it will be a bit like modeling Parkinson's in this rat. We are inducing a loss of dopamine by injecting this uh, toxin in that right place. This is a very classical model. This was done decades ago, but it's the, one of the early evidence that GDNF works really well for Parkinson's. This is a brain section. We're cutting the brain this way. If we look at how the brain looks, the brown color is standing for a marker of dopaminergic neurons. So the darker this is, the more dopamine, the more dopaminergic neurons you have in that area. So you see that in the part of the brain where we have injected the toxin, there's a dramatic loss of dopamine, dopamine cells, right? So that is, is, is a good model. This is something that we could try to recover if we now inject a drug there. If we also do a section further back, so this is not where the neurons have their projections, but it's the section where the neurons actually are. So this is where the, the bodies of the cells should be. We also see that following the injection of the toxin, we are not only just losing their projections, we are also losing neurons. So it works really well. You inject a, a toxin in one side of the brain and you get this clear, clean loss. Right? So what happens if we now inject GDNF after this lesion? So what happens is this. You see this amazing recovery of uh, fiber density following GDNF injection in the lesion site. This is a level of uh, axon terminals. I mean, it's not completely what it was initially, but, it, but it's pretty good. And the same at the level of, of, of cell bodies. So you see all those cells there have recovered, they have not died. GDNF has prevented them from dying. So this is one strong evidence that GDNF is definitely protective and good for dopaminergic neurons. I'm hoping you have heard of induced pluripotent stem cells. This is a new discovery from a Japanese scientist uh, called Senior Yamanaka. So what he discovered, he also got a Nobel Prize recently. So what he discovered is that we can make these cells called induced pluripotent stem cells, and we can make them from any somatic, any cell from your body. So if someone takes a piece of your skin, they can transform them using the right protocol into these uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. 
And the advantage of that is that then we can turn these cells into whatever we want. And we can turn them into dopaminergic neurons, which is the neurons that we're losing in Parkinson's. And this is great. It could be great in case we want to replace the neurons that we lost. But it's also great because we can actually study those neurons in the dish. So we don't have to go into the brain of a patient anymore. We can go into the, just get a scheme from a, a volunteer and then make neurons, dopaminergic neurons in the dish and look at them and see what's wrong with them. This is what we do also in my lab in Bristol and this is how they look like in the dish. So this, every blue dot there is a cell. Uh, the cells that are also green, those are the neurons. So not, not, all, the neuron, not all the cells in our dish are neurons, but we, we, you see you, we managed to get from our protocol a really, really nice high percentage. Um, and then those in red are the ones that are dopaminergic neurons. So you see our protocol allows us to make a lot of neurons and a lot of them are dopaminergic neurons, which is the ones that we need to study in Parkinson's. So this is great. This is the protocol that we, it's a bit like a cooking recipe that we need to make these cells. And it's a lot of stuff there, and it's really complicated, and we need to add the right thing at the right time, and, blah, blah, blah. But, and there's lots of different protocols around the world. Different labs use different cooking recipes. But there's one thing that they all have in common, and it's this. In all protocols to make dopaminergic neurons, in all labs in the world, they have to use, at the end, to help the neurons mature and survive, GDNF and another neurotrophy factor, which is BDNF. So this is, to me, the second proof that GDNF really helps our neurons to survive and grow because whenever we want to make them, we have to put it there. If we don't have it, we are not making healthy neurons. The third proof that GDNF is good for dopaminergic neurons, uh, although this is a bit more mixed results, is that there have been some clinical trials involved with GDNF. Uh, again, mixed results, it has to do with the way maybe GDNF was delivered and the way the patients were selected, but um, there was definitely very positive indication there that GDNF could definitely work or help with Parkinson's. What's GDNF doing? GDNF is a, a little protein, uh, so it's a neurotrophic factor that we'll have to release or give to the cell. This, this is our dopaminergic neuron, the body of the neuron. This is the uh, nerve terminal, so where the uh, signal goes. And in the end of those nerve terminals, there's some receptors, some docs, where GDNF needs to bind. So GDNF will bind to the uh, relevant receptor in the cell, and then that will trigger a, a, a signal inside the cell generates a response, and then that response needs to, leads to formation of new branches, new axons. So we, all of a sudden we have a neuron that is healthier and has more terminals that uh, innervate the area that was uh, affected in Parkinson's. So, so this is the idea of how GDNF would work and how it could help us. There's a trial that was carried out in Bristol, funded by Parkinson's UK, in, uh, led by Dr. Alan Woon, and they were actually trying, trialing GDNF in Parkinson's patients. How can we build up on this? We also know that in Parkinson's, we, we are, there is not just a loss of neurons. In Parkinson's, there's other problems as well. So GDNF is, is, if you want, addressing one of the problems, that the neurons are not very happy, that we need to make them project, send more projections. But there's another problem that we have known for a, known for a while, um, which is that in the brain, in Parkinson's, we don't only have neural loss, we also have buildup of one protein. If you want this waste accumulation, in the brain of this protein called alpha-synuclein. So if we look at the brain of someone with Parkinson's, we will have some waste build up there. Parkinson's is not just that we have less dopamine neurons, it's also that we have that waste accumulating around them, and we, we have to deal with both. Uh, again, if we go back to our neuron, how GDNF will work, we will expect it to bind to that neuron, to the receptors, but the problem is that the picture is not as clean as I showed you before. It's not just the neuron as it was, it's actually waste um, and alpha synuclein all around there. And research has been shown that alpha synuclein actually affects the receptors of GDNF in the cell, so the cell doesn't have as many receptors and it cannot respond so well to GDNF, right? So what will happen is that now the GDNF response of this cell is not as effective, and rather than giving like a, 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 the full potential that GDNF can have, we only get a reduced response because there is too much waste around it. We need to be able to not only provide neurotrophic support for our cell, but we also need to be able to clear this uh, environment around it. Otherwise, GDNF might not work as well as it could. So how can we reduce this? How can we reduce the levels of alpha synuclein in the brain? And this is when MIR-7 comes along. Um, and I hope you were with me because this is the complicated part. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fine. So 
So this is the neuron uh, that I was showing you before, but this is where a bit uh, zoomed in now. Uh, so we are seeing the nucleus of the cell, and inside the cell, all cells have DNA, which is your genetic information, the, the, the information that is passed on by your parents. So that is your DNA. Um, and the DNA doesn't just work as it is, it actually DNA becomes RNA. It needs to be transformed into a messenger uh, because the DNA is too big, it's too clunky, it's inside the cell, it cannot be uh, mobilized. So the, the information contained in, in the DNA actually needs to be transformed into a messenger called RNA. And this messenger is then what makes proteins that which I was talking about before. So there's lots of different proteins, but one of them is, is alpha synuclein. It's the protein that I told you about before, the one that was accumulating in Parkinson's. So we have a gene for alpha synuclein that makes an RNA for alpha synuclein, and then that will make a protein, alpha synuclein, that is the one that accumulates and builds up, okay? We also have other genes, like the green gene here, so that will give rise to a green mRNA, and this is the gene that gives information for GDNF. So we have lots of different genes. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, okay? Uh, but the interesting part is that, if you notice here, I haven't put colors throughout. Some of the DNA is still white, and it's because only around 2 to 3% of our uh, genome makes genes. We don't really know what the rest does. We know that there's lots of, or historically, that we knew that there were some products here that they didn't make any protein, so we don't know why the cell makes those. People thought they were junk and they had no function uh, because they are not making the proteins, which is what traditionally we thought was, if you want, the worker in the cell. But now we are starting to, to learn uh, what these molecules do. Again, before we didn't know what's the point. These things are not making any proteins. Why would the cell want to produce messengers that are not doing anything? But now we know that these things, or at least some of them, are microRNAs. So a microRNA is a type of RNA, so a type of these molecules, but it's smaller, so that's why it's called micro. And MIR7, the one I'm, uh, I want to use, is, is one of them. So there's many, many, there's thousands of microRNAs now that we have discovered, and they all have different numbers. MIR7 is the one that is interesting for us. Why? Because MIR7 actually binds to that uh, alpha synuclein mRNA, and by binding there, it blocks the production of the protein. And because it blocks the production of the protein, then you have a reduction of alpha synuclein. Right? This is a natural mechanism within the cell. The cell has MIR7, and it's supposed to be there to control uh, the expression of alpha synuclein, to keep it, if you want, in check. MIR7 will be a great candidate to, to, to test uh, uh, in our multi-heat drug, uh, because MIR7, as, as I have just explained, affects or targets alpha synuclein. So by putting MIR7 there, we can bring alpha synuclein down. We actually have discovered in my lab that the, in Parkinson's, we have reduced levels of MIR7. And that's a problem because we are losing the natural check that keeps alpha synuclein under control. So if there is no MIR7, alpha synuclein will be free to accumulate, which is what happens. So by putting MIR7 back, maybe we can solve that problem. Um, and we have also shown that uh, MIR7 can help the same way as GDNF to keep our dopaminergic neurons happier and survive longer. Now, hopefully, you understand what I mean by GDNF7. So GDNF7 is a, a dual therapy. We're trying to hit two pathways here. We are trying to use GDNF, which is a neurotrophic factor that I told you about, uh, to promote the survival of the neurons, and MIR7. And the point here is that MIR7 will be able to target alpha synuclein and reduce the accumulation of that protein in the brain, right? So I thought GDNF7 was easier than remember all that. The problem is that we, we need to test this therapy somewhere in a model. If you remember, I was showing you that evidence that GDNF worked in, in rats, in those, in those brains, and those models were based in toxins. And the problem with toxin-based models is that they don't have the full picture of Parkinson's. So in the models that I showed you before, there was a very clear loss of neurons, and GDNF was working very well there. But now we need something, something more. We need a model that has both fewer neurons and also have the waste problem that I'm telling you about. And we thought we could use, um, has a complicated name, but basically this is a, a, a mouse model that was developed in Oxford, uh, some of the, our collaborators, that overexpresses alpha synuclein. So these mice, mouse there, sorry, actually I'm lying, the mice are black, not brown, but never mind. Um, so these mice, when they are young, when they are born, they have normal dopaminergic neurons like any mouse would do. But interestingly, as they grow old, and in a mouse that's 18 months, they have less neurons and they have alpha synuclein accumulation. 
So we thought this is a good model to test combined therapy because we could try to uh, recover some of those neurons and at the same time these mice have that waste problem that I told you about. So hopefully MIR7 will be able to bring down some of that alpha and nucleon clumps. Yeah? So this is a good model, um, we think. The problem is that, yeah, we need to let the mice age. Uh, they need to go old, and which makes it a good model. It means that you know, Parkinson's is, is an age-related disorder, so it makes sense that these mice are not born with Parkinson's. They only get Parkinson's when they get, sorry, Parkinson's for mice is not the right word, but, but you know, you, you know what I mean. So it, it, they, it takes them some time, which means that our project, we won't have an answer for it until uh, two years, 18 months.